Well, good morning. Here it is Monday, May 8th, and we were going to report on Saturday for the South Florida HIMA meeting, but that didn't work out. So now we're going to re record or record for the first time for you all my presentation, and then you can listen to it. Whenever it's convenient, my schedule is going to be a little tougher for the next few weeks. So here we go. We're going to do the hot topics and current trends, HIPAA updates, and the 21st Century Cures Act implement. I'm Kelly McLendon, RHIA CHPS, Senior VP of Compliance and Regulatory Affairs for Compliance Pro Solutions. And we're a vendor that provides privacy officers and others in compliance tools, especially privacy and security. We're going to talk a little bit about the HIPAA final rule. Some notice of proposed rulemaking, EHR adoption, a few other miscellaneous topics that have popped up recently. Do a 2023 updated HICP cybersecurity practices discussion, Cures Act and information blocking, some information on that, Federal Trade Commission breach enforcement, and then a conclusion. Where is the HIPAA final rule? Well, we've been waiting for years and it was supposed to happen this spring at least that's what we were told last fall after being told really for a couple of years that it was coming because there was a notice of proposed rulemaking i think it was december 2020 it could be wrong but somewhere around there we had a HIPAA <clears throat> proposed rule issued with lots of changes to synchronize it to the cures act all of this and we still haven't seen the final rule now with the election coming. Apparently, there's been some controversy how much that rule might cost to implement, which I don't think is correct that it would actually cost billions of dollars, like an article I read said. But there may be some unintended consequences as far as fees are concerned. Uh, maybe so. Given that, I think we're talking about something that's kind of controversial. We probably won't see up a final rule anytime real soon. What we did see was the Office for Civil Rights announcing a new notice of proposed rulemaking on confidentiality surrounding reproductive rights. Of course, everybody knows what's going on in this country on this topic and we're not going to rehash any of that here but what we are going to talk about is what ocr has done from the administration standpoint federal government it's only so much they can do uh, but they can do a few things and this is some of them that they have done they're trying to actually put jurisdiction in place where state law wouldn't be able to cover so they're trying to strengthen the protection of sensitive information related to reproductive health care and bolster patient provider confidentiality. HIPAA is still in place, regardless of your political view on this topic. There's certain things you can and can't do with patients and with their data uh, under HIPAA and other rules. So this proposed rule, which it is a proposed rule, meaning it is not in place, is about safeguarding trust in the patient-provider relationship, trying to ensure when you go to the doctor, your private records won't be disclosed and used against you for seeking lawful care. Extends additional privacy protections for providers, insurers, patients, and others that any information that'd be used to disclose or disclose to identify, investigate, sue, prosecute someone seeking, obtaining, or providing, or facilitating lawful reproductive health care 
doesn't have to worry that their information is going to be accessed, dis dis uh, disclosed. They go to re define reproductive health care. They talk about regulated entities, which probably are covered entities and business associates under HIPAA. And they have a fact sheet that they've put out. Here's a link to it on the slide. You should be getting copies of these slides. Under the proposal, the prohibition and apply where relevant criminal, civil, or administrative investigation or proceeding is connecting with one of the following. Reproductive health care that sought, obtained, provided, or facilitated in a state where health care is lawful and outside of the state where the investigating is proceeding, meaning that you could have had lawful health care in one state but have another state doing something uh, some civilly, criminally, or administratively, and you get protections uh, from that law. I'm not going to try to explain everything that I'm seeing here. It's new to me too. Haven't really broken it all down. Haven't really seen a lot of opinions from attorneys yet on this, but trying to get you some familiarity of what's happening. Reproductive health care that is protected. Um, required or expressly authorized by federal law, regardless of the state in which such health care is provided. For example, reproductive health care such as miscarriage management is managed under MTALA. If you go to the emergency room and you've got a miscarriage happening and you've got to have that managed MTALA, uh, the Emer Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, makes it uh, a requirement that you get care so to stabilize the health of the individual that doesn't really change um, but is being restated if you will uh, to understand that it's in place and you can see there's another also case use case example here uh, to implement these proposed prohibitions the notice of proposed rulemaking require a regulated entity when it receives a request for PHI potentially related to reproductive health care to sign an attestation that the use is not for a prohibited purpose. It would apply for health care oversight activities, judicial administrative proceedings, law enforcement purposes, and disclosures to coroners and medical examiners. So, this attestation is really for use in an administrative, civil, or criminal type manner, not just for a routine request. Important to understand that distinction. All right, so in my world and yours, we see changes happening all over the place in our profession. And this hot topics presentation tends to jump around to different topics. So we're going to jump off now of the reproductive health care from OCR. You can look that up and get some more information as you need. But now let's switch. Some things I used to say in the 80s was I'm sure that 50 years from now we'll have electronic medical records, but I'm not sure at this point in the 80s when or how. Looks like after doing some counting, my math is right. It took about 34 years after I make that statement uh, for it to happen that we have mostly EHR adoption in the United States, especially for hospitals, but quite good adoption also for office-based physicians, which was always lagging at about 5% adoption rate until the rules came in. And between 2013 and let's say 2016, we had very rapid uptick in the adoption, both for hospitals and for physicians. So thought that was interesting to note what I had said in the past and what actually worked out. Let's jump topics again. Let's talk a little bit about some OCR officer civil rights fines that have happened for privacy. We had a lab pay 16500 to resolve potential HIPAA violation over me medical records request in January of 2023. And 
August of 2021, I guess, there was a complaint filed that this lab would not provide a personal representative of a, of a patient, like a daughter, for her deceased father's medical records with a copy. And she re made the request, didn't get the records for seven months later. Uh, OCR investigated and decided that it was a violation of the right of access provision and followed up with a fine. And apparently it wasn't a very large lab that did this, all because they refused to give medical record. After being asked to do so by OCR, they still couldn't get it right and ended up getting fined. A large provider gets a $1.25 million fine for a hacking incident happened in 2016, impacted 2.81 million patients. So when you get that notice of breach, that some records of yours have been breached and you see that there's a large number on it, it means it very well could have been uh, a fine back there or one in the works, um, even if it was a hack, because that's a very large fine for uh, a very large breach. Myself, I've gotten two breach letters recently one from a provider of care and one from CMS. So one of my providers of care had a large breach and they noticed me, I got the letter, nothing outstanding in it other than the usual breach letter notification. And then CMS also had a breach that they <laughs> guess had a breach out of Medicare and uh, or something and sent me a breach notification too. I thought that was rather interesting. So our public health emergency for COVID is winding down. I believe it has until the 11th of May uh, to uh, cease the 11.59 p.m. on the 11th. It's really a complex unwinding of several laws that came into effect under COVID-19. I think a lot of what we're going to see is telehealth payments will be impacted. Narcotic prescriptions via telehealth may have some changes. Um, COVID-19 testing will have some changes. Uh, so there's a lot of different changes that will happen now that this is no longer a public health emergency. After so much uh, problems that we had for so many years, two years at least, um, anyway, here's a fact sheet for you, and remember there are some elements that are going to continue forward. Your pharmacists are going to be able to continue to give flu vaccines, pass the end of the emergency, and things like that. So it's a mixed bag of what's t being taken away and maybe some things that are going to stay the same. There's a fact sheet uh, transition map if you want to look at it. 405D Cybersecurity, Public Law 116-321 and High Tech. So the HI Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Practices is a public-private partnership federally mandated to create a consortium that has created guidance on cybersecurity, and they've done a terrific job, in my opinion, so far that they have taken practices for cybersecurity, they've put them into place for small, medium, and large organizations. They are not mandates. They are practices that can be adopted, but they have given an enforcement discretion on the HIPAA security rule if you have put such practices in place for a period of 12 months prior to any violations you may have had. And so they're putting out there these practices and controls and then making a good reason, in other words, less enforcement on the security side for you to adopt the controls, which is what you should do to begin with. And I would suggest that not being an attorney, 
Um, if you don't adopt these controls, you are putting yourself at risk in other ways besides from OCR. So there's all kinds of reasons to adopt these controls. And apparently, uh, at least getting the controls together and getting them published and now updated uh, has worked out quite well. And it's a, a benefit that they called for. I'm not sure they understood just how well this might be accepted, but it seems like it has been. So adopting these cybersecurity practices, which we'll show you a few of them in a minute, is an example of a recognized proof of security practices, a proof of recognized security practices, RSP. That's what you have to do for 12 months in order to get the enforcement discretion so they've published all of these different manuals on the controls, a lot of information about them, tables, whether you're a small organization or a medium organization or a large organization that you need to be considering using these practices, put it all together. Here's some starter link for you in an overview slide deck. We certainly have more listed in the Compliance Pro Reference Library. The best practice areas that they talk about are email protection systems, endpoint protection systems, access management, data protection and loss prevention, asset management, network vulnerability, vulnerability management or network management, excuse me, incident response, medical device security and cybersecurity policies. These are the best practice areas that they have put out practices that you should adopt and what happens is then these can also be assessed for to see if you have them and track through a project of remediation to get them put in I'm not going to read everything on the left hand side of the slide you can do that but these are again more details about say email system configuration you know, basic email security controls to enable, and it will list them in another document. But this is an idea of the areas of subject matter that these rules apply. Now, what is important to understand is this in and of itself will not make you meet the HIPAA security rule. It will, however, get you enforcement discretion on the security rule if you have implemented these along with your NIST 800-5 66 or whatever uh, NIST HIPAA security uh, assessment items that we already have known that you have to put in and, and manage for, for HIPAA security. If you do them together, the cybersecurity practices and the other regulatory uh, requirements under HIPAA, you'll be quite well protected. So, I just made a couple of slides here to show you what some of these materials look like. And again, they're all downloadable for free. It's no reason not to grab the ones. They've got the top five threats that they've updated, the top 10 practices. And you see at the bottom, the network connected medical device security and the cybersecurity oversight and governance. For example, those are new practices that they've added here. and it, it's worthy to know that we have been calling for information governance for years, and now the government is saying, and a government public private partnership is saying that you must put in cybersecurity oversight and governance because that's a part of a program uh, to control cybersecurity threats and to manage them and to see it published is gratifying because we've been calling for it for years and years. So here's some of the practices that they have updated. Uh, also, let's take a look here at uh, some of the other documents. So they've got a main document, a tech volume one, a tech volume two, and I think the tech volumes one uh, is uh, for small and medium organizations, perhaps tech volume two, maybe for large. But anyway, they've broken the materials up. If you are a smaller organization uh, or a mid sized organization, and they define those for you, you'll be able to find what applies to you easily because they have 
so well kind of indexed it that uh, even though the large organizations also have to use the small and the medium practices, uh, they still have organized it in such a way that uh, if you're a large, you're going to deal with just the practices they publish for the large facilities. It'll have it all in there. If you're small, you don't have to deal with what's going on for the middle size and the large size organization. So again, just more information from the government on cybersecurity practices. You want to get whoever's in charge of your IT. If you have an MSP, a, a pro provider doing IT services for you, perhaps them, you've got to assess yourself and understand what your cybersecurity practices are and get them in place ASAP so that if something happens in the future, you have much less threat of HIPAA security rule violation. And here again, uh, just direct links to those. OCR has also put out a video called the Recognize Security Practices video. So what they say is, if you take cybersecurity practices, a recognized set of cybersecurity practices, of which 405D are one type of recognized security practices, but not the only ones, but if you take some and you implement them, then you are getting, you can get enforcement discretion with OCR on the security rule 12 months or more later. But what is a recognized security practice? We didn't really know that term too well prior to the publication of this HICP stuff and this 405D program. Turns out there are other recognized security practice frameworks that you might use, and this video talks about them. So I'm not going to steal its thunder, but there's a link for you. And if you are wanting to know what other recognized security practices you might employ or how it's defined by OCR in general, this video is for you. All right. So, you know, we have the ONC information blocking website it has information about the rules and all of that um, about information blocking exceptions, EHI transfers and disclosures, how to file an issue, uh, how to file um, an information blocking claim. There's an OIG Office of Inspector General portal that I think you can get in through from here. So you can make complaints about information blocking. Information blocking in the Cures Act is not being enforced yet as far as penalties are concerned for the various actors. However, they are gathering complaints and some sites are starting to track their uh, incidents that happen uh, according to the Cures Act, which is a little different than under HIPAA. And so it is important to understand where the resources are and that there's a complaints portal out there uh, and you can take a look at the link if you wish. I created a Cures Act checklist, which is how at this point it looked like a good summary list to use. So let's run over it real quick. So determine the Cures Act rules that require compliance and governance and make sure you're budgeting and that your organization kicks off a Cures Act project. You're going to have to make directory publications, your providers of care, your APIs that are being offered. Those are all going to have to be filed into various directories under especially CMS rules. So make sure that you understand that. Assemble a team of stakeholders from IT, privacy, HIM, compliance, the clinicians, whoever else might need to be on the team, clinical educators for sure. Determine third-party services required because you're going to have to assess where you are, develop what you need, including interfaces, configurations, implementations, and then ongoing operations. Don't forget about that. Um, 
been talking to sites that have been implementing, but they're not really, haven't been thinking about long-term on their compliance obligations, mostly because there's no enforcement yet, but something to think about. You need to define any automation that you're gonna use in applications for your project and ongoing operations. Identify and catalog your designated record set, the associated data classes, their source systems, the form and format to keep the information in. We suggest we do these things, but we suggest it perform a Cures Act readiness assessment, have action items that you can mitigate with so that you can go in and see a list of what you were deficient at that you need to work on. Develop and implement your fire based APIs and EHR exports with your EHR vendors. Remember the US CDI version three is out there, but also non EHR vendors and payers that might hold some of your designated record set data classes. So that's a good, let's see, engage with local, state, and federal health information exchanges to determine what do they connect to, and then look at the use of TEFCO, which are the new agreements that were put out by the government to pattern upon. They're not all fully implemented with the HIEs, but some of them are. Undertake discussions with payers about their connectivity and their self-requesting supporting claims of documentation. They're gonna wanna go get the claims data and any other supporting information for themselves with their fire interfaces through your APIs and your EHI exports out of your claims system, your medical records system. So be ready for that and understand how it's all gonna work. Discuss it with your payers. Educate stakeholders on Cures Act rules applicable to them with clinician support and training because education is key to these rules. They're very complex. Everybody needs to know what's going on. Create your policies and your procedures for each organizational area, including HIM, release of information and privacy compliance, either in support of the Cures Act, technical or operations. Define access to patient EHI, which inhibits PHI, but different under the Cures Act in some respects. For each organizational area, again, IT, HIM, ROI, privacy, compliance. Define access and disclosure of PHI and EHI in current and future state practices, including how are you invoking exceptions? Do you revoke exceptions? Do you track the documentation of your information blocking exceptions? How do you communicate with requesters? Automate your Cures Act incident and request management. That's a step that comes a little later, but I think now organizations are beginning to do that. Create and train and implement patient education about HIPAA and non-HIPAA third-party record applications. So you gotta be able to train, and sometimes you may get this with Epic or uh, some of the EHR vendors that they'll put training within their portals and for their patients, and that's great. That's a piece of it. But if someone asks somebody, let's say at registration, about a non-HIPAA third-party application to manage their health information with, how are those folks on that staff going to answer? Need to have them trained. We do have this handy checklist uh, available to you uh, from Compliance Pro, so feel free to take a look. ONC did a study on perceived information blocking practices. ONC is the National Coordinator of Healthcare IT. They're the ones that put into place the meaningful use EHR rules, continue to manage those, but also have put out part of the Cures Act. So ONC is who is responsible for the information blocking rules, which again, the information blocking rules are to keep you from information blocking. 42% of hospitals reported that they perceived information blocking in 2021. So for a long time, the information blockers were the EHR vendors. 
the IT developers. They didn't want to allow their competitors to have access to data they had collected. And they made it very hard for that to happen. And it cost who knows untold numbers of millions of dollars, if not more than that, um, to not share that information between the providers. That excuse me, between the EHR vendors. That no longer can be the case. The law has changed on that. The vendors have, by and large, that I've been associated with embraced this change. And so now they're not the information blockers anymore that we've seen. Now it's falling back towards the hospitals and the providers of care being information blockers. So we don't know yet much about it. That's just numbers that are dribbling out, but be aware you don't want to be called information blockers, but that's, you know, more and more perception that that's coming from the provider side. More to come on this as time goes, but that's what I'm hearing initially. Lab data immediately available. Well, this one is in a way kind of disturbing um, because we had been working I think for a long time to understand what to do with lab data as it comes along. Uh, you know, the big question being waiting for the physician to authorize release of the information. Physicians have had such a hold on healthcare that they made the decision that it was scientifically better for them to explain to the patients their lab results prior to giving them to them without having them explained. And that is not really an assailable position, in my opinion, because that's true. You would much prefer to have physicians advising their patients prior to any lab results that certainly might cause consternation or anything uh, that the patient didn't understand. However, they don't work that way for the patients. The patients just want to get their lab results. They can say they can handle that they may have to get them explained later by their physicians. So patients want their lab results in parallel with the physicians getting noticed of the lab results. Uh, so that's how it is now. And not necessarily everybody has heard that. Uh, we have found uh, some, you know, times where there's been some violations on giving up lab information on time, but really it has quite significantly changed the way lab results are uh, distributed in a way that we don't see happen except on decade long scales. So, you know, we had practices in place since I first started practicing, and now they've all changed uh, with Cures Act. So something interesting to consider. Onc, the Ash uh, Office of National Coordinator of Healthcare IT, in 2022's report to Congress claimed a lot of progress in setting up health information networks for sharing health information exchange and having them use TEFCA as a basis. Again, that's a 50-page uh, agreement that's it's called a trust agreement that's basically signed by the parties who are going to do the health information exchange that's trying to manage the privacy of these exchanges. And so the networks are growing. That's good news because we've been calling for this for 30 years, 20 years, and it really never came along very well. In fact, at times it's appeared, it appeared like it was hardly moving as a topic at all. Now it's really changing. And with the APIs and the fire interfaces and the EHI exports, network interoperability is going to become ubiquitous. Standardized APIs, so health ITs offering products with APIs that can make have calls made to them. Uh, to get exchanges of health data that's coming uh, along, according to the report, standardizing data within the medical records, that's definitely coming along. The USCDI is a large, large step in that standardization. I'm 
continue to be impressed with that, uh, that more and more of the record is now being standardized into this formatting. And that's a good thing because we were too all over the place with different naming conventions. All my career have has been dealt with how do you index the same information that's called different things throughout the records. This is now we're getting more and more standard data. It's not a total solution uh, to everything and all types of data, uh, but it has made tremendous progress recently. So I have to concur. Uh, standardizing the data has uh, made good progress, continues, and will continue along. Davis Wright and Tremaine, who is a law firm out of Washington that employs some of the finest HIPAA uh, experts in the nation, uh, writes reports. And so I wanted to use their thoughts for what OCR's report to Congress said. And, you know, they came up with some things like protecting the right of access continues to be a priority for OCR. So even if the Cures Act is not implemented, contain, protecting the right of access to the information is a priority OCR can use HIPAA for. HIPAA complaints have really risen. There's a significant rise in complaints. Everybody from solo practitioners to large health plans have received resolution agreements, civil monetary penalties, and OCR is trying to catch up. I read another article on that. OCR is investigating every large breach of over 500 individuals, but only a handful of the smaller ones have resulted in compliance reviews. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be ready because that what you thought was a small breach might really be over 500 individuals. Then you're going to get a full blown compliance review. So be very careful. That means they're going to go through all your policies and procedures, privacy and security. You're not going to enjoy the process. Hacking remains the top cause of the breaches. A lot of paper records involved in breaches still. Mitigation is important that you have a mitigation plan. Whatever you find your shortcomings are when you assess your security and privacy programs, have to put in a mitigation plan. And if you are working under a complaint and OCR is advising you, please don't ignore OCR, please. We've got <laughs> examples out there. Folks have decided just not to work with OCR and, and to twist their tail and pull their nose instead of just doing what OCR asks them to do. And then, of course, they get fined so uh, or have resolution agreements that are very unpleasant. So anyway, there's just some takeaways from the OCR report to Congress. Data interoperability and information sharing uh, proposed rule. So we got, not too long ago, a period of weeks, a new notice of proposed rulemaking coming from Office Coordinator National Healthcare IT, ONC. Basically, they're going to have some new certification requirements for the EHR IT developers, update certification criteria, new baseline version of USCDI, and provide enhancements to support information sharing under the information blocking regulations. To advance interoperability, improve transparency, support access exchange use, and update the program in additional ways to advance interoperability, enhance IT certification, reduce burdens and costs. So they're trying to continue to synchronize Cures Act rules with reality and HIPAA. I'm sure HIPAA is reality, but it is, but it's its own re reality. But they're trying to synchronize together how HIPAA works with the ONC rules and then CMS rules, a different can of worms, but also kind of included. Um, so that's the notice of proposed rulemaking. We don't know when it's going to come out. Is it going to come out in conjunction with a HIPAA final rule too, or is it going to have an ONC final rule, a HIPAA final rule, the ONC final rule before the HIPAA final rule, even though they're supposed to sync, who knows? We'll just have to see. 
HIPAA transactions, attachments, and electronic signatures. So in the world of claims processing, transmitting attachments has been laborious. I mean, you know, how long have the payers been able to roll payment of claims because they had to request the records and then you had to find them and send them to them and they had to review and do audits and decide whether they were going to pay the claim and all this and back and forth and you know hard copy and then manually sending electronic copies well that's all going to settle down some and there's a new notice of proposed rulemaking about HIPAA transactions. Now, remember, HIPAA is not just about privacy and security. They also have transaction set standards, which we don't pay a lot of attention to here at Compliance Pro, simply because I'm not a transactions kind of guy um, in my practice, but the uh, they're there. And so we've got this notice of proposed rulemaking that can come out independently of the other HIPAA privacy rulemaking. Um, and this one's about attachments uh, going out uh, and also electronic signatures in conjunction with the healthcare attachments, being able to sign. And this is going to help to facilitate data exchange, health information exchange, Ideally, the payers really want to be able just to go into the electronic health records of the claims that they are paying and gather whatever information is they want, maybe uh, make a request, have that information served back to them, uh, and that all happens in electronic, fully automated process. Now, whether or not that will be an electronic fully automated process is yet to be determined. There is the potential for having a manual step to authorize these attachments when they come in, but I can imagine somebody having workflow queues of long list of requests for attachments that there's not going to be a whole lot of scrutiny uh, in the policy and procedure if you have a manual step for this. So we'll have to see how it goes practice-wise, but anyway, they're trying to change the HIPAA transaction sets to have much more flexibility in attachments and electronic signatures to help have more automated processes to get the information moved between the parties, payers and providers typically here, uh, in a faster manner that would allow uh, better claims processing on a faster basis and speed up the rev cycle process. In 2021, the Federal Trade Commission was called out for a lack of having a breach rule enforcement. They created a breach rule in 2009, same time as the HIPAA breach rule. But in early, you know, in, in all the way up from 2009 to 2020, early 2022, they never enforced their own breach rule. But then in early 2022, an enforcement did happen. Good RX has agreed to pay a $1.5 million civil penalty, at least when I wrote this, that was true, and that they're taking an FTC breach. Uh, that they had and uh, getting fined for it. So Federal Trade Commission said they were going to start fining and they have. It's a big one. And that's the way FTC works. They're not like Office for Civil Rights where every complaint that comes to them must be investigated. The Federal Trade Commission picks and chooses what it wishes to enforce upon. It typically will enforce upon large organizations doing large things that are attracting bad attention and need to, you know, need some kind of enforcement, but not necessarily every fine and or every complaint. So it's important to understand how that works, but it is good that the FTC uh, was called out because they really had never used it. And then they did tighten up and, uh, 
started with the vining. So it, it's some links here to take a look at if you want to know a little more. So I was reading an article that said privacy is at risk it's as HIPAA fails to keep pace with digital health. Nearly three decades old, HIPAA appears obsolete, riddled with new technology induced gaps. Why does it matter? Because regulators and politicians are unwilling to address the shortcomings of HIPAA. Private companies are offering a fix. Kind of bounces around there, but really, I think a lot of what they're talking about is that HIPAA doesn't apply to digital health outside of business associates. If you're a business associate to a covered entity, HIPAA applies to you, but if you are digital health app on somebody's phone and you're not really a part of a healthcare organization of some kind and you, you're not really signing business associate agreements, then HIPAA doesn't apply to you. And that's, I think, at the basis of this. And I do think that we are about to let a huge amount of patient information called EHI, electronic health information, out from under HIPAA. Consequences are unknown at this time, but it can't really be all good. Uh, we certainly want to facilitate physicians and patients getting their information and using it when they need it as easily as possible, no doubt. That will be a help to healthcare in general. There's going to be a lot of negative consequences to this. There's going to be a lot of patient information that is no longer under HIPAA guidance and enforcement. So we'll have to watch for that and be careful with those applications. And we have to hope that everybody in the vendor world outside of the HIPAA community is taking privacy seriously and that the patients actually take their privacy seriously and enable their privacy controls too, which they should be presented by these vendors as part of the application, but we never know for sure. So in conclusion, things are happening at a fast pace in our industry. The Cures Act's accelerating. HIM needs to be on the compliance angles. Got to get those 405D recognized security practices in place. For now, you need to assess for them. Make sure that you're assessing whether you have the security practices in place. Release information companies are doing Cures Act disclosures and will be doing more. We need to figure out fire interfaces, APIs, EHI exports. What does that mean in HIM? That's who needs to figure it out. Different parts of the various organizations are making progress with that, especially given some of their EHR vendors are quite advanced, especially in the hospital side. But what does it mean for us in HIM? We typically don't necessarily get everything we do as being addressed by those vendors. Probably not going to see a new HIPAA final rule soon. And remember, being part of HIM, nobody's going to give us anything really directly. We have to dig it out for ourselves and figure out what the implications for our organizations are. Uh, put the compliance processes in place that we know need to be there, especially from a privacy concern for the Cures Act, the new HIPAA, things like that. Anyway, thank you so much for having me speak to your group. I'm always available to chat with folks. And if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. If you'd like to know more about what we do, please don't hesitate to ask. And I will see you next time. Thank you.